Market Manager for Sub-Saharan Africa region, and I will be the host for today's session. Uh, as you know, today's session is part of the Africa Product Showcase series. So we started four years ago with the citizen developer kick off wicked problem solving, and today's focus is on disciplined agile. Before we start, I would like just to uh, remind you with a few couple of things. One, kindly make sure to mute your microphone, and we actually encourage you to enter your questions in the chat box. So please feel free to enter your question in the chat box. Myself, my colleagues will make sure to transit the question to our speakers. Also, we are going to have, we are going to record the session. So please be informed that this session is recorded. And at the end of the session, we will send you the recording, the slides, and the small survey as we wish to hear your feedback. Before we start, we'd like also to welcome our speakers, uh, Klaus Botker. He is actually part of the Disciplined Agile Methodology and IP team at the Project Management Institute. He has over 10 years of experience coaching organizations to be more successful to drive to actually with project delivery using combination of agile, lean, and traditional approaches. Also, he has worked with several of Canadian largest companies to build awesome and self-motivated team. As well, he is actually a distant agile instructor and coach. So thank you, Klaus, for your time as well, for having with us, and over to you. All right, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for spending uh, your uh, morning, afternoon, or evening with me here for the next hour. Um, I'm very excited about that. So um, as, as was introduced, we are gonna look at Discipline Agile um, in following up, uh, sort of in continuing the PMI product showcase. So as was mentioned, my name is Klaus, and I was, um, I was originally born in Denmark where I grew up. And today I live on the beautiful west coast of Canada in Vancouver. When I am not working, I enjoy taking our dog for walks. And this is what she normally looks like when we come back from a long walk. I also really love to do uh, photography. Here's some of the photos I've taken from around the world. This is from uh, Tanzania. This is from Greenland. And this is from my backyard. So when I am working, I am a member of the Discipline Agile methodology and IP team at PMI. And we make Discipline Agile accessible and usable for everyone. We help people succeed in their own context by giving actionable, pragmatic, and contextual guidance. And some of the way that manifests itself is that we maintain and further develop what's called the DA toolkit. And we give presentations like the one today. So as we're getting started here, I can encourage you, I'll give you a moment to find some pen and paper or another way of taking notes um, because you are gonna be needing those as we go along today. And as Ahmed said, I can only encourage you to type in your questions. Um, we will get to our Q&A towards the end of this session. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? So first we're gonna talk about what is Discipline Agile. Then we're gonna look at how can I use Discipline Agile in my work and how does Discipline Agile fit into my career journey? And finally, we're gonna wrap up and have some Q and A. All right, so here is the first part where I would like you to use the uh, pen and paper that you went and found or, this, uh, or another way of taking notes. And what I'd like you to consider is draw this scale up from one to 10, one being the lowest and 10 being the highest. And somewhere in this scale, I want you to plot yourself in. What is your knowledge of Discipline Agile right now, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are in the world? And just plot yourself in. Doesn't really matter whether you plot yourself as a three or four or five or six. It's your scale, so you determine what each number mean. And then I want you to hang on to that because we are going to get back to that later on. All right. So... First topic, what is Discipline Agile? So you can think of Discipline Agile or DA as an umbrella that covers a multitude of Agile, Lean, and traditional techniques. And these Agile, Lean, and traditional techniques are architected into what we call the DA Toolkit. 
And if I had to underline one word here, it would be the word architected, because you will see as we progress through uh, this presentation today, this product showcase that Discipline Agile covers a lot of different ways of working, a lot of practices, a lot of strategies, a lot of techniques, a lot of tools. And what is really unique about Discipline Agile is that we not only have we collected all these tools and techniques and practices for you to use in your own work setting, or rather pick what fits in your work setting, we've also architected so it's easy to get, get access to. One way to think about it, a really good analogy, is that it's a toolbox or a toolkit, if you will. And inside that toolbox, we haven't just taken all the tools, you know, everything from hammers and screw, screws and nails and screwdrivers and saws. We haven't just taken them, sort of poured them into the toolbox and, sh and given it a good shake and handed it over to people and say, there you go, good luck finding what you need. No, rather you will discover that it has compartments that are labeled, that are easier to navigate. It even comes with guidance about how to use the tools as well. So you'll discover that as we go through uh, this presentation. So what can I use Discipline Agile for? Well, you can use DA to optimize your teams, your Agile teams. You can extend agility beyond delivery teams to the entire organization, and you can use Discipline Agile to accelerate value delivery. The four pillars of Discipline Agile, let's look at what those are. So that's mindset, flow, people, and practices. And mindset, let's have a look at that first, which is manifested by the Discipline Agile principles. So the principles of Discipline Agile are that we want to delight customers, and there's really nothing uh, unique about that. You see that in a lot of Agile ways of working. In fact, in a lot of ways of working, not you know, Agile and not Agile, putting the customer at the center is, is, not, is not unique to Discipline Agile. What is unique as we move further down the list is that we want, if you sort of, if you combine the next three, be awesome, context count, and uh, uh, sorry, context count, be pragmatic, and choice is good. I'll go back to being awesome. But if we combine those, context counts, be pragmatic, and choice is good, to me, those are very unique to Discipline Agile. And as you'll discover as you go through this, Discipline Agile is very context-driven. We want to be pragmatic, not purist, and we believe in offering up choices to people. The one I skipped, be awesome. Be awesome means that we want to give you individuals and teams the tools and the practices to be the best versions of yourself so you can be the most awesome self. And that ties into also giving teams choice so they can, so they can uh, pick a way that allows them to be awesome. Another principle of Discipline Agile is that we want to optimize flow, as in the flow of value creation inside our company, inside our organization. We want to optimize that, and we want to organize around products and services. Again, that has to do with the value creation inside our organization. We want to organize around that because we know that's going to make us more effective. And finally, the, the last DA principle is that we want to be enterprise aware. And what does enterprise awareness mean? Well, that means that when I come to work every morning, I know that my work, what I do every single day, I know that that ties into the overall goal of my organization, and I know it supports my organization path towards that goal. It also means, so that's sort of a, a bottom up, it also, it's also top down. It means that my work is so transparent that the leadership of my organization, they can see that in fact, what I do every day is supporting the goals of the organization. And if it's not supporting the goals, they can do some correction. They can either make me aware of what the goals are or they can tweak the goals, whatever it may be. We have lots of choices here. And finally, enterprise awareness also means that when I when I build something, not only do I um, not only go do I go ahead and build something, I will sort of look inside my organization to see, have someone built this in the past or have someone dealt with this challenge in the past? And if they have, how do they solve it? And then I will take reuse how they solve that. That's also being enterprise aware. So that was the mindset manifested by the principles. Let's look at the life, uh, the flow, which is manifested by what we call life cycles. So a life cycle is a starter pack for teams that provide them with a foundation for their way of working. You can sort of think of it as it's something you pick off the shelf and it's one of the first choices you make when you look at how am I, how are we going to work as a team? And the Discipline Agile life cycles that cover a wide range of wows or ways of working from iterative, scrum-based and flow, Kanban-based to team of teams and lean startup scenarios, which means that 
regardless of how your team best works and regardless of the situation, the context that your team faces, there will be a life cycle as in a starting point for your team to pick, whether it's scrum based or whether it's Kanban based or whether you're you're working on a large program where you're a team of teams or whether you're building something new and you don't know if there's a customer base for it. Well, then you're going to need something exploratory and using a lean startup uh, uh, startup hack. So that was the mindset and the flow. Let's look at people. So this is the view of um, the discipline agile primary role, primary and supporting roles. So if you're familiar with Scrum, you will recognize some of these roles. Stakeholders, again, there's nothing unique about that. Uh, team lead is what uh, in Scrum terms would become a would be a Scrum master. Team member, again, nothing unique about that. Without team members, well, we have no one to build what it is we're building. Then we have the product owner. Again, that's something you're going to be familiar with if you've practiced Scrum before. Um, and then finally, we have the, another role that is not present in, in Scrum or any other um, um, agile way of working, which is the architecture owner. So the architecture owner is sort of the mirror of the product owner. The product owner is typically the one that will go out and work with what we call the business side of the organization. So that's the side of the organization that brings work to the team. And the product owner will make sure that that's organized and that's prioritized and the team understands what they're working on. The architecture owner in, does not go out and work with the business. No, rather the architecture owner looks at, well, the architecture, how are we building things? So the product owner looks at what we're building and the architecture owner looks at, well, how are we building it? How are we building it in a way that has sound quality and sound architecture? So we're not, are we cutting corners? Are we, when we release this into the hands of our customers, is it going to be, is it going to break or is it going to be a poor experience? And that's what the architecture owner looks at. So he or she becomes sort of a, a voice of sound design, if you will. And then at the bottom, we have our supporting roles. And these most often are needed at scale. If we have smaller teams or just a few teams, we don't we don't often see uh, the supporting roles or we see them in fewer instances. As soon as you start to scale up with more teams and bigger teams, well, then you, you, you likely will need some of these supporting roles. So it could be someone that's an integrator, as in if you're working on a team of teams, you will need someone to help integrate all the different components that the teams built to make sure that they work together. You may need a technical expert. That might be someone who is specialized in, in, in user experience or user interface design. You may, need, you may need a domain expert of a certain domain inside your organization. You may need an independent tester. Again, this we, we most often see this when we have um, a team of teams or, or larger teams. So that was the people side of the, the people pillar of the four pillars of Discipline Agile. And finally, let's look at practices. So, this is, so as I said in the beginning, Discipline Agile is sort of chock full of different practices and techniques and, and ways of working. You can, again, think about it as a toolkit or toolbox where we have all these different practice, all these different tools that you can pick up and go, okay, I'm faced with this challenge, so I think I need a hammer or I think I need a saw. And one way that we've architected this is in what we call goal diagrams. And this is an example of a goal diagram right here. So the way that we read these goal diagrams is that, well, um, we want to grow team members. Well, that's a good goal. We have a team and we want to make sure that our team members are continually growing and continually becoming better um, at what they do. Well, what are our, what, you know, what do we need to think about? What do we need to consider when we want to grow our team members? Well, these are the, the middle row. That's what we call the decision point, as in, well, do I want to improve their skills and knowledge? Do I want to provide feedback? Or do I want to sustain the team? And then finally, to the very right, we have what we call the options. So if we look at the way that we can provide feedback, well, I can have what's called a 360 degree feedback. I could do annual reviews. I can do continuous feedback and so on and so forth. And when we look at improving skills and knowledge, we can have hackathons, we can have open spaces, we can do training, or we can have book clubs. There are all these choices and as you'll see later on, the way that you use this is that you are faced with a certain challenge or something that you want to solve. Maybe you're maybe you're a scrum master on a team and the team is sort of starting to stagnate a little bit. And you ask yourself, well, how can I continue to grow the team members? How can I sort of revive them a little bit? Well, maybe what we need is a book club or maybe we need a hackathon or maybe we need to run an open space. or maybe they need maybe they're struggling with a certain tool that we're, we're using today. And so let me run some training. And then so you go into this goal diagram and you look at, 
you look at the options that you have. And then even further through that, in if you look at um, in our in our books, you can then look for trade offs and further guidance when to use this practice and when to use this technique. So this may seem uh, just pausing here for a moment. This may seem a little bit overwhelming. We will go back to this uh, later on and we'll also use this in a more concrete in an even more concrete way. All right, so this is where uh, we can use the chat for this, um, or you can use your own note section. So we're going to play a small game called True or False, uh, just a short game here. So I'm going to read out a statement, and then I want you to write down. You can use the chat, and you know, want to write. You know, I want you to write the word true or false, depending on what you think the answer is. You can also just write T or F for short. All right, so here's the first statement. Discipline Agile supports multiple life cycles. So what do you think? Is that true or false? You can go ahead and type it in the chat. You can also type T or F. I'm getting some truths. Yes, that is absolutely true. Discipline Agile supports multiple life cycles because we know teams are faced with different situations. So why only have one way of working? We should have multiple ways that support the multiple different contexts that teams are faced with. All right, next one. Be purist is one of the D8 principles. What do you think, true or false? Go ahead and type it in the chat. You can type a T or an F. I'm seeing some a little bit of a mixed bag, some false, some truths, and that is false. Be pragmatic is the D8 principle that we're we're looking for here. Be purist is the opposite of that, and that is what we have when we look at other agile ways of working, such as Scrum and Safe, the Scale Agile framework. They are more often purist in the way they approach um, how they work, as in here are the set of rules that you need to follow, whereas Discipline Agile is pragmatic. We say, well, here are some guidelines that you should follow, and then you make your own choices in terms of how you want to work. All right, last one. The architecture owner is the voice of sound design on the team. What do you think, true or false? I am seeing some T's, mostly T's. All right, that is true. That is exactly the role of the architecture owner. He or she will make sure that what we're building, we're building it the right way. So it doesn't break when we move it into the hands of the customer. All right, so um, wrapping up, what is Discipline Agile? Let's look at, at the fact that Discipline Agile puts us in a position to choose and evolve our way of working or our wow. Then you might ask, well, Klaus, why is that important to choose our own wow? Well, first, let's look inwardly inside the team. So inside, so in looking inside the team, every team is unique and we face a unique situation. I'm sure you've experienced this as well when you've worked on, worked on multiple teams. They've each, even if it's been inside the same organization, each team has been faced with a slightly different context. Sometimes the variation is very small and sometimes the variation can be a lot bigger. It's also the fact that we're constantly learning. We're not stagnant, we're constantly picking, even though the learning doesn't just mean that we attend training. It also means that we're picking up new information and new knowledge as we continuously build what we're building or continuously work on what we work on. Looking outwardly outside the team, the other teams that we collaborate with, they are evolving as well. They're not standing still. They're continuously learning as well and their context is evolving. And our internal and external environments are ever changing. If there ever was a case for this, then it is the COVID pandemic that we're going through right now of an example of an external environment that is ever, that's ever changing. And even something that we can't control, this, this continuously happened. And as we've seen, some organizations have dealt with the COVID pandemic better than others. And in the case of those that have been dealing with the COVID pandemic better than others, it's been because they have been, they have been able to evolve and adapt their way of working so it matches this new situation that the pandemic presents us with. Finally, sticking to a prescriptive, non-evolving way of working leads to stagnation and limited benefits. So here's an example of what it looks like when we're adopting a new way of working. So we've all been through this, that, well, there is this initial learning curve where our effectiveness takes a little bit of a dip. You know, things then start to get better. 
and then we start to stagnate. We hit the limits of prescriptive frameworks. So this is a study done in 2017 by Reifer, and it found that using as agile methods, we only see a 7 to 12 percent uh, increase in productiveness compared with teams that do not use agile methods. And it looks even more bleak when we look at agile scaling frameworks such as such as SAFE, that we only see a three to five percent increase in productiveness compared to teams that are not using an agile scaling, scaling framework. So pretty bleak and, and uh, um, not very encouraging numbers. Which begs the question, well, how do we do better? So here is you've seen you've likely seen this loop before. You may not have seen it exactly represented like this, like this, but you may have seen it as the classic Kaizen loop or plan, do, study, act, which is continuous improvement. So here we have we want the way that continuous improvement and the plan, plan, do, study, act cycle work is that we identify a problem and then we look at what we ask ourselves, what what are potential solutions to that? And then we try that solution out and we assess the effectiveness of this as in we study it. And then we adopt what works and we abandon what doesn't work. And then we share the learning inside our organization. And then we go back and do the loop one more time and loop one more time and loop one more time. That's why it's a loop and that's why it's it's continuous. Well, sometimes experiments fail and you learn something, which is good, but it doesn't get you closer to the goal. So failing fast is fine, but how do we sort of turn that upside down so we start to succeed sooner? Well, if we get better at that second step, we can start to succeed sooner and improve faster. And by leveraging the Discipline Agile Toolkit, we can better identify what is needed in the situation to solve the challenges that we need. Again, think back of that goal diagram you saw earlier with improving team members. Imagine if I didn't have access to that, and I, one of the problems that I was faced with was that my team is stagnated and people don't seem to be learning anymore and they're not thriving. So. How do I how do I continuously how do I you know grow my team members? Well, if I didn't have access to the goal diagram, the second step of identifying potential solutions, I would be like, well, I don't know. Let me go watch a YouTube video, and then I may learn about one or two techniques. If on the other hand I go to the DA toolkit and I look up grow team members, I'm presented suddenly not with one or two techniques. I'm presented with 25, 30, 35 techniques, and in addition to that, I also have access to some guidance and some trade-offs of how to use those different techniques. So, excuse me for a moment. This is where we have this book right here, the Choose Your Wow book. This is so it says here it's a it's a handbook. So exactly, this is where you then you would look up and you could then further find these techniques and read about what are the trade-offs, what are the benefit, and where can I learn more about this technique. That's in this handbook. And as a as a as a um, sort of as a bonus. If you are a PMI member today, you can download this book as a PDF copy for free. I'll share, uh, I can share a link uh, later on. There's also a link later on in the presentation. So summing this up, we have then, uh, we have adopt, adopting a prescriptive method of framework such as Scrum or, or, um, or SAFE. You see that it stagnates over time because it's not evolving. We can then add continuous improvement to that, and that will certainly get us all lift us all of that stagnation. But we can do even better. We can we can use guided continuous improvement, where we get and not only do we do continuous improvement, but we also add the guidance of the DA toolkit to get better at to sort of flip the coin from failing fast to succeeding sooner. All right, so that was a brief view at what is a Discipline Agile. So let's ask the question now, how can I use Discipline Agile in my work? Well, let's set the context. So the context in this in these examples are that you work on a team and you are a part of a value stream. And value stream really just means that you are you are part of value creation inside your organization. So that can be anything from you work on a software team to you work in a in a help desk team to work in the marketing, you work in sales. These are all part of a value stream inside an organization, as in we have an idea over here, and then that idea for it to be realized and put into the hands of our customers will need to flow through a certain stream and value is added in each stream. Again, doesn't matter whether you are, again, on a software team, on a sales team, on a marketing team, the PMO, um, help desk, at each step, wherever you are along that stream, you add value to that stream. And then finally, we have the final product that is that is put into the hands of the customer. All right, so let's look at, there are three scenarios we're gonna look at here. Let's look at the scenario one. 
So scenario one is that, again, remember the context is you want, you work on a team and you're part, you're somewhere along the value stream inside the organization. So the first scenario is that, well, let's adopt the DA mindset. And we just looked at what that means when we look at the DA principles. And then know that the DA toolkit is easily accessible for your team when you need it. And you can keep your existing wow. Well, what does that mean? So again, in this scenario here is that, well, we're, we'll, we're gonna continue to practice Scrum. Uh, and we know that we have choices beyond the Scrum framework. And we know that because we're adopting the DA mindset. If you just adopt, if you just do Scrum, Scrum doesn't tell you that you have choices outside of Scrum. Scrum is very, is what we call silent on that. And um, same thing with other frameworks, such as the scale either framework SAFE or, and, and Kanban and so on and so forth. They don't tell you that there are choices, but the DA mindset tells you, great, you know, do what you're doing today, but know you have choice. You're not locked into this. Be pragmatic. Um, so we know we have choices beyond the Scrum framework, and we know that we're empowered to make improvements should we encounter challenges that Scrum does not solve. We know that we can find ideas and guidance in the DA toolkit, such as improvements that go beyond Scrum to solve potential future challenges. And what could that look like? Well, that could look like in the future, we may want to we may want uh, uh, other ways of exploring the uses of the product we built in addition to the user stories we're, we're using today. We can also see a potential need for become better at modeling our solution. So here's another, here's a, a concrete example of this team referencing the DA toolkit and finding the relevant goal diagram. So in this case, this is the goal diagram for exploring scope. So as you see there, they say that, well, we think we're in the future, we're probably gonna run into some problems where user stories is not gonna cover us anymore. So we're gonna use personas and we're gonna use user story maps to help us explore that usage. And we also know that the way that we model our um, our solution today is, you know, we're doing it one way, but I think we can get even better at it. So let's actually reference the DA toolkit to figure out what other choices do we have. Maybe we're just using informal sessions today. Maybe what we need is also interviews. Maybe that would help build up the way that we do our modeling sessions. The team further goes, we may also see a future need for finding more nuanced ways to prioritize our work. And today we struggle with how to accept changes to our work. So we may have to look at that as well at some point. So again, uh, the look at the team then pulls up the, the goal diagram They look into the toolkit and they pull up the goal diagram and they see here, well, what are all the ways that we can prioritize work? Maybe today they're only prioritizing by due date, which is a great start. But what if that we need to then, what if that's not making us as successful as we can? What if we need to also prioritize by risk or business value or cost of delay? Using again here the goal diagram and looking at the options, we'll see, oh yeah, you're right. Using just due date is great. And the reason we've been missing some of this is because that, well, we haven't looked at risk in terms of how to prioritize the work. Accepting changes, a lot of agile teams, a lot of scrum teams, they will only accept changes in future iterations. Well, that's good, but what about if the change is needed right now? Well, we see that we have another choice. We can accept changes during the iteration. And this brings me to a point that we haven't covered so far in this goal diagram. You may be wondering, well, Klaus, what does it exactly mean when something is bolded and italicized? And what does it mean when there's an arrow pointing up? Well, when, when something is bolded and italicized, that means that this is a really good starting point. Not knowing anything about your context, it's a really good starting point. And the arrow pointing up means that, generally speaking, what's at the top is more favorable than what's at the bottom when it comes to increasing your team agility, which means that you can see here in this case, accepting change during iterations is generally speaking more favorable in terms of increasing your agility than say accepting changes in future iterations because we have that arrow pointing up. All right, so that was the first scenario. There's a team that's practicing Scrum today. They're not gonna make any changes right now, but they are adopting the DA mindset and they, they know that the DA toolkit is there waiting for them when they face challenges that Scrum is not able to solve. Let's look at the second scenario. So the second scenario is again, we want to adopt the DA mindset, but here we take advantage of the DA toolkit for options and guidance. And let's start to increment, start now 
to incrementally improve our existing wow or way of working. So what does that look like? Well, the team goes, we're starting where we are and we do the best in the situation that we face and we strive to always do better. And we find the ideas and the guidance in the DA toolkit for guided continuous improvement or GCI. So the team goes, we've improved our, our current wow by switching from Scrum framework to the DA Agile lifecycle, which offers us a phased approach and lightweight milestones. So this is what the DA Agile lifecycle looks like. And you can see there at the bottom, we have phases. We have what we call an inception phase, a construction phase, and a transition phase. And Scrum doesn't offer any of that. In fact, a lot of the Scrum teams I've worked with, they will make up words for these phases. They will say, we need to sprint zero, which really is the inception phase, which is the getting ready phase. But Scrum doesn't have that, so they have to make something up. And a lot of the Scrum teams I've worked with, they will make, they will make something up for the transition phase as well, which is moving what we built safely and securely and with high quality into the hands of our customers. They'll make up words like, well, we need a hardening sprint or a testing sprint. These are all sort of make up words for we do in fact need something to get ready to properly put this into the hands of the customer. Whereas DA goes, well, why make up words for it? We have the faces right here. So this team improved their way of working by, by switching to the DA Agile lifecycle because it offers them these phases. It also offers them the milestones that you'll see down below the phases. So a milestone is for example, proven architecture, which means that as as you know as soon as we can when we start building what it is we're building we want to prove let's say we're building a new iphone application as soon as we start building that we want to prove as soon as we can that the way we're setting out to build this new application we can actually do it and we can do it with the tools that we have because by proving that as, as early as possible we avoid these these uh, surprises towards the end where we go oh yeah, we couldn't use that tool. And now we see it's not working and we're not ready to release into the hands of the customers. So we want to prove the architecture, what we're building as early as possible so we can lower that risk and we, we have higher quality, we have fewer surprises towards the end of what we're building. The team further goes, we also consulted the DA toolkit to improve the way that we start our projects. Well, this is one way of starting the project, which is developing the common vision. So they've had that before, and they've had, they call it maybe something else. Maybe they call it project charter or something else. Doesn't really matter what you call it. It's the fact that before you start building something, you have agreement between the team and the key stakeholders that this is what we're building. This is roughly how long it's gonna take. This is who's involved. These are the high level risks and so on and so forth. So they were struggling with that. And they referenced the DA toolkit and they go, well, before it was very stakeholder driven and now we want something that's collaborative. Before it was very detailed and that was really slowing us down. So we want something lightweight. And before we were doing a kickoff meetings, but we didn't have a way to visualize afterwards how we did, you know, what was in the, our, our common vision. So we want to do information radiators in addition to the kickoff meeting so we can visually display what it is, um, what it is we're building. Finally, the team also says, we've also consulted the, DG, the DA toolkit to improve the way that we end our projects. So what does that look like? Well, this looks like this, that, we have a goal diagram for ensuring production readiness. And one of the points where they were sort of falling down and scraping their knees early was that they didn't train and educate their stakeholders enough, which was that um, when we put, before we release something, we wanna make sure that they know how to use this. And we wanna make sure that uh, maybe some of our stakeholders are is our help desk. We wanna make sure that they have an FAQ, that they have, that they, uh, they're equipped to answer questions from customers when we release this new iPhone application. All right, that was the second scenario. So the first scenario was a team that goes, we're practicing Scrum today, it's working for us, we're not gonna change anything right now, but we are starting to adopt the DA mindset so we know we're empowered to make choices and we have choices to make. The second one was, well, we still adopt the DA mindset and we're starting to change the way we do our wow because we're faced with some challenges right now that we need to solve. The third scenario again is very is is again starts out with adopting the DA mindset and taking advantage of the DA toolkit for options and guidance. And it's a little bit more drastic here because we want to get rid of our old wow and sort of completely adopt a new wow because the way we've been working, maybe there's been too much of dramatic change in their context. So just replacing a little bit here and there, some nuts and bolts here and there is not really going to be enough. They need to completely change the way that they work. 
So let's look at that more closely. So the way that this team goes that while well, we start to analyze our context and we pick a life cycle that's fit for purpose, we add practices and techniques to further address our unique context in areas that have been challenging in the past. Similarly to the second scenario, we find the ideas and the guidance in the DA toolkit for choosing a way of working or a wow that is fit for purpose um, and it's guided continuous improvement. So this team goes, we adopted a new wow as our context dramatically changed as a consequence of COVID and having to switch to a work from home style. We needed more visibility into our work and a way to keep work and process down. So we adopted the lean life cycle. So what's unique about the Discipline Agile Lean Lifecycle, which is Kanban based, is that you can see they're highlighted. Work items are pulled when capacity is available to, uh, to work on them, which keeps our work and process down. Also, a way, a way to visualize is that we have this work item pool where we can start to categorize our work into different classes and categories. So some of our work is categorized by business value. Some of it is categorized by expedite. Some of it is categorized by fixed delivery date and so on and so forth. And even further to that, we also have now a daily coordination meeting, which help again, brings visibility into what we're working on. And in addition to that, we also starting to do uh, retrospectives and, and process improvements through evolving our way of working. The team further goes, we also needed to get much better at coordinating within the team, within the program, because not only are we working on a team, we're also working in a program and within the entire organization. So they reference the coordinate activities goal diagram. And there are a lot of stuff highlighted here. Obviously they didn't do all of it, but they went here to look at what are our options. So coordinate within team. So today they did before they didn't have coordination meetings. Now they have those. And maybe maybe they also found a way, they found a way to better visualize their work. So they found those ideas and those options inside this goal diagram. The way to coordinate across program, well, again, they can start to, they will start to visualize their work more. Maybe they also start to use what's called common cadences, as in we sort of start, we start and stop at the same time. And then finally, coordinating between locations. Maybe they need, you know, they adopt this more collaborative tools. Maybe they'd adopt the Microsoft Teams. They didn't use that before, but they needed that now because they're, they're switching to this work from home style. So they need a better ways to coordinate between locations. So again, what they did was that they adopted the DA mindset and they started to look into the toolkit. What are some practices that can help solve some current challenges that we have right now that's born from the fact that we need to start to work from home? All right, those were the, the three scenarios. Let's do, uh, let's have a quick quiz time. And again, as before, you can type into the, uh, um, into the chat whether you think it's uh, answer A, B, or C. Um, so, Let's start. So first question, A, B, or C, what does the DA toolkit contain? Only agile practices, only lean practices, agile, lean, and traditional practices. What do you think, A, B, or C? Go ahead and type that into the chat. I'm seeing mainly Cs. Yes, that is the right answer. Agile, lean, and traditional techniques. Next one, when using Discipline Agile, what life cycle must you always start with? The Agile life cycle, because it's very similar to Scrum, the Lean life cycle, because it allows you to visualize your work, or it depends on your context. Maybe you don't need to pick a life cycle at all. What do you think, A, B, or C? I'm seeing mainly C, so you guys are good. That is C, all right, let's do one more, all right. What best describes the DA milestones? They're formal, they're lightweight or milestones. DA has no milestones. What do you think, A, B, or C? We didn't really talk about this one, but let's see. So I'm seeing some Bs. Yes, amazing. We didn't cover that that much in detail. Yes, they are lightweight, that is what is unique about the milestone and it helps keep uh, the whole sort of the whole toolkit and the whole life cycle very nimble and very agile, if you will. All right, last topic, then we're gonna get to the Q and A. So how does Discipline Agile fit into my career journey? So let's look at a couple of different examples here. So here's an example of, I have some agile experience and I want more general agile knowledge. 
Well, this is where the PMI ACP, the PMI Agile Certified Practitioner, is a really good starting point. If you have some already some Agile experience and you want more general Agile knowledge. And as you gain more Agile experience, you can then go and take what's called the Discipline Agile Senior Scrum Master or the DA SSM. Another scenario, another example is that, well, I'm new to Agile. I've not practiced Agile before. Um, so where do I start? Well, a good place to start is our Discipline Agile Scrum Master or DA SM uh, certification. And again, as you then start to practice Agile and you gain more Agile experience, you can then take the Discipline Agile Senior Scrum Master. The last example is that, well, I'm already experienced in Agile and I need to deal with more complex situations. The, with my, the, my knowledge of agility today is not helping me solve the complexity that I'm faced with at work. So where do I go? Well, the a really good place to then start is the Discipline Agile Senior Scrum Master. You can then further from there continue your journey. Once you've taken the DA Senior Scrum Master, you can then further your journey into, well, I really want to start coaching DA teams. We have the DA coach, or I want to lead organizational transformation. And this is where we have the DA Value Stream Consultant. Obviously those two, the DA coach and the DA Value Stream Consultants require some previous experience. So here's the full picture um, of the uh, career journey map. All right, so uh, let's wrap up and then we will get to the Q&A. As part of the wrap up, I have this brief video that I am going to play and just uh, um, let me know with a yes or no if the sound is okay. Otherwise, I'll, I'll do a couple of tweaks. So uh, here we go. There's a reason most agile organizations don't see the results they expect. Their agile doesn't have any, well, agility. Because true business agility comes from freedom, not frameworks. This is Disciplined Agile, a hybrid of the world's leading practices and methods that provides straightforward guidance to enable you to choose your way of working. It's a people-first, learning-oriented, hybrid Agile toolkit that will enable you to effectively combine strategies from Scrum, Agile modeling, extreme programming, Kanban, Agile data, safe, and many others, so you can tailor and scale based on the situation you face. You'll be able to look beyond prescriptive, agile frameworks and get better results and reach true business agility faster. All right, thank you for the feedback with the sound level. So wrapping up here and summarizing, so success doesn't come from adopting a prescriptive framework or methodology such as Scrum or SAFE, although it is often a good start. For true business agility, we need to choose our own agile way of working, optimizing for our unique situation. And Discipline Agile is a rich, comprehensive, well-organized and well-documented toolkit of strategies to help your organization be more successful with Agile. And DA brings a disciplined, agnostic, professional enterprise approach um, to which the uh, to Agile, which our industry has been lacking in the past. All right, so time to get back to that very first note you made, which was the scale of one to ten that you drew down, that you sort of drew on your piece of paper and you plotted yourself in there somewhere, whether you're, um, you know, where you plotted yourself in. So what I'd like you to do now is just take 10, 15 seconds to consider, well, have I moved? Have my knowledge of discipline agile moved? Have I moved maybe from a three to four or from a five to seven, whatever that is. Um, and feel free to share in the chat. Uh, hopefully you went up, maybe you stayed the same or maybe even went down. I hope not, but you never know. So yeah, feel free to share that in the chat, um, your, your movement on this scale right here. As I mentioned, uh, here are, you can continue your learning journey um, at pmi.org uh, slash discipline agile. You can also learn more about our certifications under, uh, by going to this link right here. And I will, I will drop the link to, um, to getting a, a copy, a free copy of the Choose Your Wild book. If you are a paid uh, PMI member, the way to do that, I will drop that in the chat as well. 
which brings us to the Q and A. So I'm gonna I'm gonna unshare my screen, and then I'll find that I'll find that uh, the link to the book, um, and feel free to type in your uh, your questions into the into the chat. Klaus, thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, actually, we have, uh, I just, again, we encourage the participant to enter your question in the Q&A. Meanwhile, actually, we received two, I mean, previous questions from our volunteers and chapters, and if I may just ask you this question. So, we're talking about Discipline Agile. So, the question is, how Discipline Agile be applied to nine software situation? Yes, thank you for that question, Ahmed. So, non-software teams. Um, to answer that question, I think we need to take a step back and look at where agility comes from. So, agility. There's. It's no secret that agility is born out of software development. When the Agile Manifesto was coined 20 years ago, it was coined by a group of software developers, and they all got together because they were. They were doing something different than back then. What was sort of the the the, the most prominent method today? What we call traditional or waterfall. That they weren't doing software development that way, but they weren't doing software development the same way. They were just doing it differently than the traditional web method. So they got together and they they sort of talked back and forth about well, how do we summarize the way that we do software development? So from there, the agile soft the sort of the the agile manifesto. Was born and it was like the full name is uh, is is the Agile Manifesto for software for software development. So again, agility has its roots in software, and it's it's a really a bit of a well, you can't really call it a shame because everything has its roots somewhere. What is a shame is and what's a missed opportunity is when teams look at agility, you know, whether it's Scrum or Safe or DA, whatever it may be, and they go, this looks really cool. Too bad we're not so we're not doing software. Too bad we're a marketing team, or too bad we're a sales team, or too bad we're a PMO. So we can't possibly use this. And that's a, the shame is in or the, the the is in the missed opportunity because you could absolutely use it. And again, so taking this to discipline agile, again, it's no secret that the two co-founders, Mark Lines and Scott Ambler, both have their background in software development. Uh, so when DA first was sort of was born and put together, well, it had a, a pretty strong flavor of software development. Today, though, we have moved out of that. We have we have worked really hard to make it much, much more agnostic and really tone down the software side of it. So a couple of things very concrete. So one, if you go to projectmanagement.com, you will find there's a webinar that I just did recently about uh, exactly this topic, which is, well, how can DA be applied to non-software teams? So I would encourage you to go watch that, and I can find the link for it and put it in the chat as well. And and just summarizing what that, what that presentation was about, it was really about the fact that, well, there's so much there in Discipline Agile Toolkit that you can pick up and use as a non-software team. So for example, the, the example we used in a webinar was that, well, if I'm a procurement team, well, I may be doing procurement in a certain way today because that's how I like to do my procurement. But the thing is, context counts. So I may be I may be doing procurement for, for 10 different teams, and these 10 different teams will have 10 different contexts. So I can't just take my one way of doing procurement and sort of apply as a one size fits all to these different teams. So I need to, I need to I need to adopt this, I need to adapt the way that I that I do procurement. So it's fit for purpose for each of these teams. That's sort of the first way. And the second way we looked at it was, we looked at in this webinar, we looked at a, a team of uh, mortgage brokers just from a bank. And these mortgage brokers, they were stakeholders in a, in a project. And they, they from that working with an agile software delivery teams, what they actually learned themselves was that, well, we're doing when we have some non-client work and the way that we do this non-client work, it becomes very down prioritized. It's not evenly distributed between us and it's often late. Uh, so, you know, uh, how do we do this differently? So they adopted the, the lean life cycle because it gave them better visibility into the work. It gave them a way to distribute the workload more evenly. And so we can see that that's an example of how, again, two non-software teams, a team, uh, the procurement team and a team of mortgage brokers, how they can adopt agile ways of working and improve and evolve their, their wow.
that was a very long answer. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great comprehensive uh, answer, actually, and we, we we hear that quite often. So I'm very happy to to see that there is a dedicated webinar for these questions and this topic, and we will happy to share the link with the participants, volunteers, chapters, and members in Africa. Thank you, Klaus. We do have another great question, actually, from Cedric. Uh, he's asking, uh, who is responsible for implementation of DA? Is the responsibility of a Scrum Master, Project Manager, or anyone with DA knowledge? Any particular professionals who apply DA? Good question. Thank you. So who's responsible for implementing? So I would say that that with any, really depends on how you implement it. I would say that if it's if it's um, just one team, let's again go back to the context that we had in this presentation right here, and we say that well we're a team, and we have a couple of things that we're challenged by today that our current way of working isn't really addressing for us, so we're just going to go ahead and make some changes. And in that case, I would say it's anyone on the team. Then anyone on the team could sort of you know pick up DA and go, well hey have you seen this? This is really cool because up until this point we've sort of been Maybe they've been thinking, well, we can't possibly make changes. We're not empowered to do that. And I would say, well, any team is empowered. Obviously, you need to consider other teams around you and the organization as a whole when you make changes, not just make something that has a negative impact on other teams, because then you're not being enterprise aware. So, but bottom line, teams are empowered to make changes if it's going to improve their way of working. So I would say anyone it could be a scrum master, a product man, uh, you know, a project manager. It could be a team member who goes who may view this webinar and to go, this is really cool. We're afraid, you know, there's this thing that that's challenging us and we haven't really got an answer for it. Let's let's look at DA. Let's see if DA has some choices that that will help us solve this challenge. And, and chances are it will it will likely have that. That's at a sort of very micro level at the team level. If we look at the organization as a whole, if we're looking at sort of an organizational transformation, well then obviously, yes, we need scrum masters and project managers and team members to drive this forward. But at the top level, at the organization level, we will need someone that's becoming this this sort of this transformation lead um, to help the overall organization address the change and adopt DA. So not just adopt DA in individual teams, but also in marketing and in finance and how we do procurement and at the at the C level, at the leadership level as well. All right. Any other questions? So I have a question, Klaus, while we just see other questions from the audience. Let's say if I'm an individual and I would like to study uh, or, or actually uh, apply for the DSM. So what are the preparation documents or materials that I need to go through to be prepared? Is it the wow book is enough for me to go through the DSM exam or do I need to go to the self-based DSM that BMI has launched recently? So yes, so there, there are sort of two paths you can pursue the DA, the DA's uh, Scrum Master. There is, you can take a course with a trainer, um, either virtual training or in person. Likely right now it's gonna be virtual. I, I doubt that very many instructors will have in-person training right now, well, because of the pandemic. And the second path is you can take the uh, the online on-demand learning that PMI offers for, for DASM. Both uh, covers the same material and both qualifies you to sit for the exam. Now, in terms of preparing for for taking that class, well, I would say, well, watching presentations like this, maybe going to projectmanagement.com and watching a couple of other presentations about DA and sort of just getting a sense of what is this all about, and then and then I I'm going to uh, post that link in a moment. You know, reading so not reading this full book that that's not how it's been that's not its intended use, but reading the first section, which is six chapters. Um, will cover a lot of the basics of Discipline Agile that we covered here today, obviously a little bit more in depth. Uh, um, that's a really good start for sort of just, just you having an understanding of what is Discipline Agile before you go into the class is gonna help you make you even more successful. It's not required, but it's a really good idea. Um, so you sort of know what you walk into. Thank you so much, that's great. Six minutes, and I think it's a great opportunity to have Klaus with us. So please, if you have a questions, enter a question in the Q&A, and we are able to answer the questions immediately. If you think that there you have a questions and you may need to, to actually reach out to us later, so please feel free, Our my colleagues, myself, will go through to you, your chapters. 
we are happy to answer all the questions related to DA. And I would like to take this opportunity as well to to uh, give you a heads up to uh, our members, volunteers, chapters in Africa that we are currently, uh, the BMI Africa team are currently working on a DA campaigns and initiatives. So basically we are looking into all these products. We're trying to bundle in products and we also discussing the best price for the region. So kindly you stay tuned for uh, actually almost around 10th of June next month. We'll have something and we're going to announce it through our chapters, communication, social media and other channels. All right, any other questions? Oh, there we go. Will DA evolve as new tools are developed? Yes, you you figured it out. Exactly. It will continue to evolve. It is not fixed and that wouldn't be pragmatic. Um, so you will see um, you will see that, uh, you know, if you check back and uh, well, actually, let me give another example of one way that it has evolved is the fact that um, under uh, under form team, the goal diagram for form teams about how sort of the preferred way of working together. One of the default choices was to be co-located, which is a great, but it's not really possible right now during this pandemic. So uh, um, the uh, um, uh, that default choice has changed from being co-located to using to using uh, um, collaborative tools. So that's one example of how it's evolved and it continues to do that. And your example of uh, citizen developer and merging that into the discipline agile, yes, that is likely going to happen as well, along with other sort of other um, wicked problem solving. So part of wicked problem solving is already in discipline agile. One of the one of the mindsets in there is to apply design thinking and wicked problem solving has, you know, is, is based on design thinking. So that's already part of it. Um, citizen developers not in the moment, but it will likely be weaved in into the future in the future as well. Yes, I agree. It's very cool. All right, one last question, or we get to wrap up a little bit early. All right, so at the end with that note, would like to thank you guys for your presentations and I like actually the. The quiz part, so thank you. That's very engaging. And I would like to thank our participants, the great questions as well. So as I said at the beginning of the session, we would like to we're going to send you an email with the survey and the slides and the recording. Please, if you have any further question, feel free to reach out to us directly and we'll make sure to get you the answer. So with that note, thank you very much and wish you a great afternoon, a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. very much.